So ultimately then, we looked at, uh, in this example, we looked at the various design, fixed design, um, no move, move option, and we value flexibility in which was the best design under various criteria, expected value, downward risk, upward risk, standard deviation, capital expenditure. This is, uh, this is typically refers to the initial capex, what you put down in front, and it's very significant because when, once you've built it and you see how things are going, you have more confidence in uh, what's at risk so that you're generally speaking, or investors are generally speaking more inclined to put in more money, but it's often that initial hit, which is important. So reducing that initial capex can be very important. So what we've done here was to highlight in bold what seemed to be the best a solution according to that criteria. And um, the, so these flexible ones here are the best and um, the, uh, the best design. There's one exception. The one exception is if you're simply thinking about the standard deviation of it, that in this case, as in often the case is, uh, that the less variance in the possible return is associated with a fixed design, not when you're possibly expanding it and pushing out the boundaries, so that if you are fixing on a robust design, which is that notion of the standard deviations being small, um, that the worst economic design is also happens to be the robust design, which illustrates the point that although robust designs can be very important in some cases, such as when you're trying to fix fit things together very precisely as an axles to steel axles to steel uh, railroad wheels um, or tuning into a signal that in general, when you're dealing with flexibility, you want to increase the maximum possibility, uh, the best possibilities as much as possible. You want to push out the standard deviation. You want to increase the possibilities of high returns and you are operating exactly against the um, notion of a uh, smallest standard deviation. Now, how are putting this all together? So on this scale, you have the um, economies of scale factor from having none for the high alpha, the highest alpha, to uh, the lowest economy of scale we looked at, to various learning rates, and the value of the flexibility. And what I would like you to take away or think about taking away as we change the economies of scale, that when the economies of scale decrease in this direction, that uh, flexibility is more valuable or contrarily with high economies of scale, they're not as great or they miss it disappear in your case. And as learning increases, it's better. So that if they're, uh, uh, Lesser economy of scale, less aggressive economy of scale, more learning that's better. So the takeaway in some ways is, and this is a very notional representation, somewhere in here where there is some learning and, and not too heavy economy of scale, there's a sweet spot. So that in general, the point being, in general, that having looked at the range, it seems very plausible that a flexible design in some ways is a very good uh, solution. So that's where I wanted to leave things with the takeaways. I think that the uh, LNG case demonstrates that as I start off in the beginning, that um, flexible design can provide clear economic benefits. It's pushed by the discount rate and learning effects building on modular designs that mitigates the economy of scale. And the, economy, the actual expected value of the compact project under uncertainty is less than the deterministic estimation. So that's the takeaway. And that's where um, I've finished for today's presentation, bringing together a lot of the features of what we've been trying to 
share over I've been trying to share over the course so far. So please your comments, questions, and so forth. 